Continuing our analysis into the motor vessel Daly collision with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, the NTSB a couple of days ago released a new report showing their completed electrical testing. And that report gives us some very shocking results. So today we're going to take a look at could a loose cable have really caused this entire collision and brought down that entire bridge? Come along with us as we scan through their report and come up with an answer. The motor vessel Dally slammed into the bridge support pier of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland on March 26, 2024. So shortly after the March 26th event date, which is when the MV Dolly container ship collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, causing the bridge to collapse, the NTSB had set up this information page here about the investigation details. And so, of course, the last update they gave us here was this investigative update in June 2024. And so I've been monitoring this page ever since then to see if they would release the docket. So I would check the docket every week just to make sure I'm on top of it to see the second that they added any new data in there. And they finally opened up the docket. So if you click on it here, it takes you to the docket. And you can see they finally opened up this docket just a few days ago here on September 11th and they loaded it up with these documents. So there's some useful stuff in here. Most of the items you'll see on the docket here are typical stuff that you'll see during investigations like they want to get all their certificates of classification and everything. They're just you know regular certificates. They don't really mean anything. But there's two documents on here in particular that I want to focus on. Now this first one I already showed you on the update a few months ago where it showed here their preliminary report. I'll put a link to the video down below where I showed you the full analysis of this report. If you remember, we they talked about the engine room there and the architecture of the electrical system on there. And of course, the, they gave us this breakdown here, the simplified online electrical diagram of their power distribution system. And we're going to be studying this chart again today for today's document. So out of all of these other ones, this 41 page document, which was released on September 11th, is the one that I want to take a look at here because this has some important new findings. So this is it right here. And let's take a look at it. So here's your release date, September 11th, 2024. Here's all of the entities involved in the investigative group here in addition to the NTSB. So most of these are like the owner. These are the owners of the Dolly, HD Hyundai, Heavy Industries, HHI. They were going to be probably the most valuable in terms of inf information on this particular test. So believe it or not, all of this testing was actually done while the Dolly was at port and we were all watching everything else going on. Like when are they going to remove Dolly? When are they going to get the bridge off of the Dolly? But you can see here, they did four different sessions and the first session of testing took place on April 1st. So they were actually fairly quick in starting to get this done. Here you can see the NTSB investigator here. He's examining the circuit breaker on the Dolly's low voltage switchboard. If you look at this other picture here, the NTSB investigator is applying tamper evident preservation seals on the high voltage switchboard. So this keeps anybody from like opening up the cabinet and maybe fixing something before the investigators could get a look into it. They wanted to change over from the transformer two to transformer one, which is the redundant step down transformers that connect the 440 volt bus to the high voltage bus. And it says here, but HR1, which is one of the breakers located on either side of the step down transformers, failed to close. So they couldn't get it to stay closed. It popped open. If we go back to the early summer where I talked about the preliminary report, and this is the that drawing that they gave us. Remember this right up here in this gray shaded box is the 6,600 volt high voltage bus. That's what drives some of the bigger things like the, the giant coolers to cool the refrigerated containers. And then you have the low voltage bus here, which is 440 volts. This drives everything else on the ship. And it steps down from 6600 to 440 through this transformer right here, transformer one. And it also does it here through transformer two. So this is a path right here. And then this is a redundant path. So you usually choose which path you want when you're operating the ship. So what happened was they were trying to step away from this path and switch over to this path by closing LR1 and HR1. And they found out that this guy popped back open. So they couldn't keep this running. So that's the problem that they're describing right here. 
And they also said here that, look, troubleshooting HR One's failure to close led to no results. So right now they're kind of puzzled as to what caused that to pop back open. And the HHA representatives contacted their headquarters and the company agreed to arrange a second envoy to continue troubleshooting. So these guys couldn't get it working. So it looks like HHR is escalating it and sending guys that might have more capability. So then here's a second session of testing was done on April 9th and 10th, about a week later. So when we look at this first photo here, that's an HHI engineer, and he's examining the high voltage switchboard control circuitry. And then over here on this picture, we see we have an HHI engineer is inspecting the HR1 high voltage vacuum circuit breaker. That's what a VCB is right here. This is the high voltage vacuum circuit breaker HR1. So he's looking at it to try to see, well, can we figure out why this guy here was popping back open again. Why was he tripping? So these get inputs from different sensors and something was causing it to trip. See, he's looking at this guy right here. That's the VCB. And he's trying to figure out why did this guy keep tripping open? Why couldn't they get it to stay closed? Okay, so from their April 9th and 10th testing right here, here's the protocols that they uh, were testing by. The only thing they discovered here was that the lockout relay line healthy button was a little dim. So it says here, Hyundai recommends replacing the lockout relay line healthy light. So there was no other anomalies observed. So here they, they tested the VCB and that's that vacuum circuit breaker and they found nothing wrong there on it. So then right here, they checked on the voltage meter on the VCB under voltage relay and everything is normal. They're measuring 113.9 volts. So, so far they're not finding anything wrong. So they're confirming voltages on different lines here and everything is fine. On this test date, and remember this is test number two a week later, they did successfully complete the changeover from transformer number two to transformer number one using their protocols. So in other words, what they did was they successfully switched from using this leg to using this leg over here and everything worked fine. So this seems to be an intermittent problem. So it looks to me right now that what we're looking at here is an intermittent problem. And intermittent problems are like the worst type of failure modes for us engineers because something is working one minute, but then the next minute it is no longer working. Why is that? What's causing this intermittent failure? One of our root causes here for intermittent problems could be something isn't making a good contact. So it's contacting now but next minute it isn't then you try it again and then it, it's contacted again so oftentimes you can have problems like that either with wiring harnesses not seated all the way properly or screwed in or something like that sometimes like on a printed circuit board sometimes you have these pick and place machines in the factories when your board's going down the factory line there right and these pick and place machines put the chips on the solder and then it goes through these ovens and if your oven profiles are not set right, you know, maybe the solder doesn't flow properly and you, you get one little pin on one little chip that doesn't get enough solder on it. And that can be a problem, too. As they continued on with the testing, now they went here and they did a test and they successfully completed the changeover from transformer number one to transformer number two. So they went in reverse. So now they went in reverse. So they switched from operating this path to switching over and operating this redundant path. Okay, so here's where it gets interesting because now they're finding a problem again. And it says here, when attempting to change over from transformer two to transformer one, the HR1 was closed manually. At this time, they observed a differential current trip 87T. So there's the error message that they got on the, on the system which resulted in HR1 VCB opening. They tried to cl close HR1 and LR1 in order to activate this path, but HR1 pops open again because it get that error message, because it got that error message, right? See that 87T error message there. So when they looked at the data log here on April 10th, they said that this TR1 has not returned this error since the vessel was delivered in March 2015. After about five minutes, they tried to close the HR1 and the differential current trip occurred again. 
So they're having problems now where they're trying to close that breaker and it keeps popping back open again. It's important to point out that this path is what was powering the vessel during this test. So this was running just fine and they were getting ready to activate this one and switch it into place. It kept tripping right here at HR1. So again, you're seeing more evidence of intermittence going on here because they, they met together and they said, okay, let's do this. Let's close and open the HR1 VCB in that test position two times. And so they did it two times and it closed and opened without failure. So then they conducted the changeover from Transformer 2 to the Transformer 1, and then that was successfully completed. And then they conducted the changeover back, so they're going from Transformer 1 to Transformer 2, and that was successfully completed. What they were going to try to do next, which, which they didn't need to do, was they were going to try to ground the Transformer to discharge any residual voltage on it. So that's what it says here, by earthing. So by that, they mean they're, they're doing a discharge path to ground, to, to bleed off any residual voltage that might be on there for whatever reason. But they said, however, there was no need because the changeover was completed successfully. Okay, so, and remember, we're still on the second series of tests on the second week of April. And so now they're connecting the laptop to extract all of the, the readings and everything. They gave all of the testing data here to the NTSB and the interested parties. So on April 11th, they monitored that T1 breaker for 24 hours and the Synergy personnel reported no anomalies were detected. Okay, on that group call. Now Synergy, those are the people that are running the ship. They're the employees that, that we've seen in the jumpsuits running the ship. Okay, so they found no other anomalies. So then they did a session three of testing. So this is probably when that other group of engineers arrived and they're bringing more equipment with them now. And so right here, you can see that these HHI engineers are installing and monitoring the power analyzer connected to the low voltage switchboard. So they've got this machine right here connected up in, into the switchboard and it's wired up in here into the switchboard and they're gonna be monitoring different voltage levels at certain areas to see if they can't maybe trap where that error code was coming from. So it shows here that the crew did replace a fuel injection for generator engine number one, which didn't seem to have anything to do with any of this. And now this is interesting here. It's not clear what happened and why, but they were trying to synchronize the two of the diesel generators. So this is called a paralleling operation. So what happens is they start up both of the diesel generators and they put them on at the same time, but they have to load share exactly and it's gotta be perfect. And when that doesn't happen, they can't get them to parallel perfectly. So that is what's happening right here. You can see it failed during the parallel operation. So they didn't really say what type of failure it was. Was one getting more load than the other? Um, was the rotational speed different? Was the angle slightly different? Were they having trouble locking on to that angle? So that we don't know too much about. And then here we have the NTSB requested that HHI submit a separate explanation as to the cause of that alarm, that 87T alarm that we were getting in the synchronization failure, as well as the test plan for the blackout. So that was submitted already. So they've identified the final drawing versions of all the different circuits. So they're gathering all of this information. Uh, yeah, they looked at the generator engine, the GE fuel oil supply systems, and they didn't find anything wrong there. You know, again, the pumps, nothing wrong there. They did more flushing pump tests. Everything was fine there. So they checked the automatic sequential starting of the essential pump. They did tests on there. Everything's fine. Yeah, they checked the steering and the rudder. Everything was okay there as well. So continuing on here in session three, they did more testing here on the main engine and analysis. And so next they did, you can see up here, an electrical power health check. So what they did was they take these analyzers and they hook them on to the system here. So Fluke is one of them. I have one of their digital voltmeters. I use them all the time. And they sit there and they basically log the data for 48 hours. So they have a whole protocol here that they have to follow for that. On other systems, they did further testing. They didn't find anything wrong there. So then they came in and did session number four of testing that lasted from April 26th through the 29th. The HHI engineer is inspecting the wire connections within the high voltage switchboard. And also shown there is all that terminal block arrangement. 
It has the individual wire connections. They check the operational status of all of the machinery in the cargo holds, and they didn't find any problems there. They check the operational status of the diesel generators. They check the scrubbers. They checked the low voltage system during the scrubber operation. Everything was fine there as well. So basically all of the tests that they did here, like the fans and everything like that, and the cargo holds, everything's fine so far. Next, they downloaded the power analyzer's data. And right here, see, they showed that review of the data, showed that at the time of the blackout, they did that simulated blackout on April 29th, the voltage recorded at the low voltage 440 switchboard and at the control voltage for it, which is a 24 volt control voltage, you can see both of these instantly dropped to zero. And then this is important too, because they want to check here on that LR1 that all of the circuit parameters are correct. So the first thing they have to do is they have to measure the resistance on that UVT coil. That coil is what will help uh, trigger that under voltage and it will let you know that, hey, there's something wrong and the system is under voltage right now. And that will trigger the LR1 to open up and that will also cause your power failure. So they checked on it and at 138 ohms is the manufacturer's designed resistance. So, and they measured 140 ohms, which is perfect. So it's right in there and it's within that specification. So that coil there for the under voltage, that should be working just fine. So then the engineers here, they simulated energizing the LR1 under, under voltage and they went ahead and checked the contacts for it and there was no anomalies observed. So as far as they know, LR1 is working just fine. Okay, now here's where they started to find problems. So now they're checking the HR1 in the high voltage 6600 volt switchboard. So again, they're back up here now and they're checking him to see if there's anything going wrong right here. So this is where they find the first sign of problem right here because if we highlight this, the engineers checked whether the cable cores connected to HR1 were properly secured. During this examination, it was observed that cable connection for the ACB non-closed alarm 125X, that contact 1LV6 was loose. So this is the cable right here, or could be one of at, at least one that they found that was loose. Okay, so that's the alarm that it would generate there's the cable contact ID when you look on the bus where all the cables are connected. That one was loose. So the engineers advised that this cable would not cause a 6.6 .6 kilovolt blackout because the relay is normally open. So the purpose of this cable is to identify non-closure of the LR. So this was sort of a red herring. All right, so they found a loose cable, but I'm still wondering why is a cable loose? I always thought these things are kind of connected and then screwed down. So HHI, those are the engineers, they disconnected that one LV6 cable and they reconnected it and no blackout was observed. So this proves that it sort of was a red herring. Yeah, it was a loose cable, but pulling it off and then plugging it back on had no effect. It did not cause a blackout. So then they redirect their attention to LR1, which is down here. So we were looking at HR1 a minute ago. Now they come down to LR1 on the low voltage bus Let's go check his wiring. So now it says the HHI engineers tried to inspect the operability because HR1 needs to be closed first to, in order to close LR1. The HHI engineers attempted to close HR1 but were unable to close it. To investigate the cause, the engineers opened the HR1 BCB cover. As I showed you before, here it is right here. He's, he's got it open and they're looking at it and they checked the cable connection of this HR1. So this is the uh, vacuum control, and they checked everything using a multi-tester. So the HH1 engineers observed that the HR1 UVT coil was not receiving 110 volts as it should be. See, so this is a problem, but this UVT coil right here has to see this 110 volts right here. If it doesn't see 110 volts, it will trip because now it's telling you, oh, I have an under voltage and it will trip the system as it should. Like it says right here, boom. So it's not receiving the 110 volts. So the engineers reviewed the schematics related to this under voltage, you know, to this under voltage section right here. 
and they inspect they inspected all of the relays in the HR1 path. Their problems seem to start whenever they try to close HR1. There's a problem. It's not getting that voltage, that 110 voltage, that lets them know that, that everything's working fine. So the investigators eventually researched this a little further, and they found that the cable cores that connects the DB1X1, I know we're using a lot of acronyms here, but this is how they label the connections, and we'll show you this in a minute where it is. This is your relay, DB1X-1, that I have highlighted above. So this relay is where they're looking at right now. So the cable cores, they were saying right here, and this isn't just one cable, apparently it was several cables because loose cable core means usually there's a few of them. So right in here where it connects, it was loose. Yeah, so if we zoom in a little bit more, we can see that you have these nodes at either end of the relay, 382 and 381 right here. So the engineers found that the cable was loosely connected at node 381 right here. So this condition right here can create an open circuit. Why is that? Because it's not getting the 110 volt to it. So it's open circuit there to the coil. So remember, this is a coil on this relay. So this would trigger an under voltage and it would release the trip of HR1. See, here's your HR1 right here. That's that vacuum breaker right here that vacuum controlled breaker. So the problem is there's a relay here providing input to this breaker. And when this relay senses that it's not getting the 110 volts from the power rail, it sends a signal here and it trips the breaker. So that's the source of the problem of what was causing the blackouts, most likely on this ship that caused everything to lose power. And it says right here, it would cause a 440 volt blackout because if you blow this breaker here, you lose your 440 volts. So everything where I was just showing you here was contained in this area for HR1. So HR1 is that VCB, that circuitry was attached to it. All right, so check this out. So then they did a simulation because they knew that if we, if we just go and pull that core of cables out, it should trip and power interrupt. So on this day here, they warned the crew to prepare for a blackout. And then one of the engineers took the cable right here, disconnected that cable core at node 381 that I showed you before, and HR1 immediately opened, followed by LR1 opening. See, HR1 opened, and then LR1 immediately opened. So they're simulating the loss of power here to the 440 volt bus. Okay, so the HHI engineers and the parties observed that all equipment powered by the low voltage 440 volt switchboard, including all the operating lights throughout the vessel, immediately lost power. See that? So they were able to successfully simulate that loss of power that they suffered the night of the collapse. So the NTSB, the HHI engineers, and the parties observed that the low voltage switchboard gained power after approximately 10 seconds once the automatic transfer from transformer number one to transformer number two re-energized the low voltage switchboard. So what they're saying is everything, this path here was normal, this green that you see here, it was running like this. They came up here to HR1 and they, they unplugged that cable cord going to the under voltage relay, which tripped HR1 and then tripped LR1. So now you have no voltage here on the 440 bus. Within 10 seconds, HR2 and LR2 then switch on into place and then you have voltages restored on this redundant side over here while this side on the right remains open. So after that they then downloaded the data and that's all we have at this point in the investigation. So this all was done by actually April 29th. Hmm. They know what this tells us, don't you? It tells us that they knew pretty much by around April 29th what the whole cause of this problem was that caused the blackout that caused the dolly to crash into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, making that bridge collapse. Now, of course, you have to wait for the full report to really see, is was this really the cause? But I was able to show you how the engineers were able to duplicate that power failure, that shutdown of all the 440 volt system there. So the question now becomes, how was that cable loose? Because, you know, in military and in maritime environments, it's very strict there how the cables and everything should be done. They should be plugged in and screwed in. My opinion, that's the way it should be. 
So the question is, was it not screwed in tight? Was there a manufacturing error in the cable? Was there something wrong with how it's plugged onto those terminal blocks? Now the NTSB did show us a terminal block that they had removed from the ship for further testing. So I don't know if that is part of the problem or if they just wanted to characterize how the terminal blocks are supposed to act. Uh, we simply don't know at this point. So we have to wait for further testing here. But it seems to be that the culprit of this whole collapse may have been just simply a loose cable. But they really need to answer that question. Why was that cable loose? Because do you think this is the only ship in the world that could have this problem right now? Hey, one other thing too. If you haven't seen any of the other videos that I've done here on this analysis of the MV Dolly crashing into the Francis Scott Keybridge, make sure you look over here. Here's a couple of good ones for you to try. And you can just binge watch. I've, I've probably done a couple of dozen videos on this already. But they're all interesting and I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you on the next one.